The Historical Society is very proud to host this evening Drs. Luschim Arvid Charlie and Nancy Turner, who will present as part of the Society's Historically Speaking talk series, Luschim's Plants, Traditional Indigenous Foods, Materials and Medicines, a whole Kaminum or Cowichan Ethnobotany. This is based on the book of the same title published in September 21 by 2021 by Harbour Publishing Company, which by the way was sold out by December and is now in its second printing. Cowichan elder Dr. Luschim Arvid Charlie was born in Cowichan, one of the Cowichan villages, and has lived in the area of Duncan, British Columbia all of his life. From the age of three, he began learning about plants and their various uses from the elders in his family, including from his great grandparents. Since then, he has made it a personal priority to gather knowledge about the natural environment, his book being a compilation of over four generations of tradition and observation. In 2007, Dr. Charlie received an honorary doctorate of letters degree at Malaspina University College that in recognition of his extensive contributions to the teaching of Coast Salish culture and traditions in a wide range of contexts, as well as for his commitment to the protection of the environment and preservation of the Hulkaminum language. Dr. Nancy Turner is internationally known for her work in ethnobotany. She has worked extensively with First Nations elders and cultural specialists in Northwestern North America, collaborating with indigenous communities to help document, retain and promote their traditional knowledge of plants and habitats, including indigenous foods, materials and medicines, as well as language and vocabulary relating to plants and environments. Nancy is a distinguished and much recognized professor emeritus in the School of Environmental Studies at the University of Victoria. She has authored, co-authored or edited many publications in the areas of ethnobotany, traditional ecological knowledge and sustainable resource use in Canada and British Columbia. Thus, Jim and Nancy, we are absolutely delighted that you're giving this talk tonight as part of the Historical Society's Historically Speaking talk series. I hand the screen over to you. Thank you ever so much, Q. Um, it's a real honor to be here. Well, I will get started and I know Liz Jim will join us as soon as he is able. And I will just, share my screen with you and put it on to slideshow. There we are. Um, uh, this is a talk that we've given a couple of times based on the book that uh, this team and I worked on together. And it's been an absolute pleasure to, to uh, be able to work with Luz Chim. Um, yeah, as Q mentioned, he, is, uh, he has amazing knowledge of plants. And I first learned about that many years ago when I visited the Cowichan Nation and we happened to be on a walk together with some uh, Cowichan youth. We went down to the Cowichan River together and uh, he started pointing out the plants that were growing along the river. It was remarkable how, how many different species that he knew and also knew the Cowichan names and all the various uses from medicine to food and uh, materials and so forth in a really deep way. And that's uh, when I asked him, if he might be willing and interested in documenting his knowledge. And eventually that led to the book. So I want to first recognize uh, that we're in the, uh, where you are in Ladysmith, uh, the territory of the Snunamis Sn uh, nation, nation. And I am here in the Snunamish territory of the Nanaimo people. Uh, this team is with uh, Cowichan, Coetzen people in the Duncan area. 
And uh, we raise our hands to all the Salish and peoples of the Salish Sea area and give thanks to your long time looking after and care of your lands and waters over countless generations. Haichka. These are just a few of the species that we have in the book. I also want to uh, thank Howard White, who is uh, and the other members of the uh, Harper publishing team for helping us uh, produce this book and bringing it out with such care and um, attention to detail. And team and I also want to thank our families, our with Jim's wife, Darlene, my husband, Bob, I say my personal photographer and more, <laughs> and to Marina and Q and all of you there in the Lady Smith um, Historical Association. So as Q has said, uh, Liz Chim has an amazing background. Um, and it's no wonder that he has so much knowledge because as a very little boy, he spent time with his great grandfather, whose name was Luschim, and whose name he Luschim himself has taken. But also his parents, who who are also well known, Simon Charlie, who uh, was an artist and carver, and uh, his mother Violet, uh, his his parents and his grandparents as well. So he uh, had a whole family of knowledge holders and specialists who spent time with him as a child and growing up. And he in turn has done the same for his own family and is teaching his son and sons and daughters and uh, grandchildren and many others about his knowledge. He's also a medicine practitioner and some of the medicines that he uses, of course, are very private. And uh, many of them have spiritual applications that are um, that are not really uh, part of the knowledge that we provided in the book because this is very private knowledge and usually passed just from one individual to another over the years. Um, and meanwhile, I'm pointing out uh, a fishing lure that his father, Simon Charlie, made is at the Museum of Anthropology at UBC, and also some memories of times that we've gone out together, Liz Chim and I and friends. Um, we went up Mount Prevost, we went uh, to Mount Aerosmith and uh, into the Gary Oak Preserve at Samanos Lake. And everywhere we went, of course, Liz Chim was teaching me about the plants that are uh, described in the book. And his, uh, his family, of course, has a long history. This photo uh, of a, a fishing weir, couch and weir, is, dates back to just before his great-grandfather, Liz Chim. Um, so this is the kind of technology, fishing technology, that his ancestors would have used for thousands of years. And, uh, and here it is uh, about from about 150 years ago. So today I'll just give a brief introduction and if Luz Chim uh, wants to say anything, I hope he'll just speak up um, and uh, I might leave a few pauses so that he could say something if he wants. It's handy to have a Computer technician for our son. This team. Um, yeah. I'm remembering the time we went up to Mount Aerosmith and we were looking at the plants up there and the berries and the, the yellow cedar growing at the higher elevations. Yeah. And what I remember you telling me was the yellow cedar bark is very fine and it's used in weaving like the red cedar bark, but is even softer and finer. So that if you go to a household where there's yellow cedar, you know the man in the, of the house isn't lazy. Yes, uh, men folk of the house not lazy if they have yellow cedar and 
bear skins and things like that. Uh huh. So these places that uh, we visited and that are part of the Cowichan territory have been used for thousands of years and people have used and lived from the resources but have not destroyed the resources because they've used them sustainably and they've learned how to enhance the productivity of the, the species that they use. And of course, plants have been important for the couch and for all this time, since time immemorial, thousands and thousands of years from the different habitats, from wetlands, from uh, uh, woodland, from the edges of woods, used for food, for materials, and for medicines, for making canoes, for paddles, for clothing, all of these things, for fuel. And maybe, Liz Team, you could talk a little bit about how people move around the land to go to different areas to get different resources. So let's start, uh, we'll use a modern, modern calendar in January. Around that time, we'd be getting ducks uh, that come around in the winter time. And then towards spring, we'd be getting the herring eggs. Now we're looking at this picture in front of us. The herring eggs also be in the green shoots of the uh, spellum. I think it's called sword bird, sword bird, I think. Uh, so later on, it's, it's not as good as it as when it's nice and fresh in January, February. So we travel to different places. Um, like for the herons, we'd be at um, the gorge around uh, March, waiting for the herons to get there. We'd go there early to make sure we're not late. Some, sometimes they do arrive early. And at the same time, Mount March would be in the Fraser, Fraser River, waiting for the hooligans to come up. <coughs> and of course, when we're there, we never travel anywhere for one reason. So we're waiting for the shoots to come out and berries and things like that. Um, summer comes along and we're getting those things. The berries. It keeps on going like that. Um, early in the spring, we'd get in, um, roots from the um, um they're one of the first to come out in the, in the spring, early spring, the roots. And you dig down into the into the water to get them. You're talking about the wapato? Uh, no, no. Uh, the wool is, uh, oh, I don't know what you call it. It's uh, round reeds, not the flat ones, the round ones. Of course, the camas bulbs you get, I guess, in the springtime. Yeah, it's kind of later spring, or what do we call later spring? Uh-huh. So mm -hmm. you're moving around the land a lot. That's, yeah. that's the message, harvesting different things in different places at different times. And so you get to know your entire territory over the course of the year, I imagine. And just uh, to give you an example, starting in the ocean with uh, one of the important ocean plants, the bull kelp. Ms. Jim, would you be able to say, pronounce the name for bull kelp? Okay, uh, um, um, 
um, the yeah. uh, apostrophe by that letter, it, it means a slightly exploded sound, um, and the, and as Lishim uh, told me, these are anchored to the rocks below, so you can tie your canoe and or your boat to the kelp and it'll hold it in place when you're fishing or whatever. And you can also cure your you would bow by placing it inside the hollow part of the kelp um, and heating it. And then we have uh, the tree fungus. The name uh, means echo. And, and they call it echo maker sometimes. It's the one that they say returns the sound when you're calling in the woods. It'll re reflect the sound back on you, but it's also gives you good protection. Would you pre pronounce the name for us, Lusching? And is that also the name for telephone? Oh, well, that's a new one. So that Dr. Elkup is in charge of the echo. Uh, uh -huh. Echoes you back. And that's what the telephone does. It echoes, but it's yeah. the other person. So we call it, also call that Dr. Elkup for the telephone. And then we have the horse tail, which is quite rough to the touch. And uh, it's good for polishing. It's like a sandpaper for polishing wood, like knitting needles, but also it's good, a good medicine. Voila. Voila. Thanks, Liz Jean. And that's related to the word for stomach. Is that right? Yes. Mm -hmm. And I'll try to say this one. Scum hum. Got it. You got oh, it. Oh, good. Okay, this is the giant horse tail. It in the springtime, it's one of the ones that you can eat the young shoots of, but you don't want to eat the the grown up plants. Uh, they wouldn't be good to eat at all. But those young shoots are really nice in the spring. And then we have the sword fern really important plant and used in ceremonial for ceremonial purposes. Liz Jim, would you pronounce the name for the sword fern? It'll, um, kind of separate the S from the TH and separate the TH from the E. Salem. Salem. Yeah. Thank you. And Tlaseep, Tlaseep. You got it. Okay, that's the licorice fern, the little fern that grows under the moss and on rocky bluffs um, under moss. And if you pull out the rhizome, you can just take a little piece of it. Uh, it's very, very sweet. And so it's it's good. People use it as an appetizer, a mouth freshener, but also um, for sweetening medicine. Anything else to add, Luz Chim? No. Uh, good for coughs, eh? Coughs and sore throat. Well, there's lots of um, spiritual uses for it, which I cannot share. I mentioned earlier um, that the spiritual uses are not part of our book because mm -hmm. those are private, that's private knowledge. Yeah. Then we have the three species of the true furs in the genus Abbeys, uh, the grand fur, the amabilis fur or silver fur, and the subalpine fur. And all of those can be found within parts of Cowichan territory, and they all have these really nice blisters on the bark that have a really strong liquid pitch inside. So if you punch the little blisters, you'll get this very strong smelling pitch. And um, 
you can use it to make a salve. You can use it for, uh, for cleaning, um, for removing scent. And of course, the boughs are, are good, make good for bedding. And then the yellow cedar we talked about where we saw on uh, Mount Aerosmith, mm. Pashalok, um, which has very fine inner bark uh, and is, makes the best clothing. So there we are. If you, you know the man of the house isn't lazy if there's yellow cedar bark in your house. And also the wood is good for carving paddles and um, also for the ceremonial dance shirts. You've seen the little wooden paddles when the dancers dance and they, uh, they click together and make really nice sound. Those are often made from the yellow cedar wood. And the coastal juniper is now a separate species from the one in the interior. It's a tree juniper that you find just along the coast. The very strong smell, it's named for its strong smell, um, but it's, and it's used for cleansing um, and for ceremonial purposes as well. And I love this one that Lucien taught me about, the dancing plant, the uh, lodgepole pine. And he showed me why it's called the dancing plant. If you take the branch with the needles on it, a small end of the, the bough, and turn it upside down on a surface, on a flat surface, and just tap the surface a little bit and jiggle it, it will dance around just like a dancer on the surface. of, And, and it's, it really looks amazing to see. But the pine is used for other purposes as well. You can actually eat the inner bark and uh, the pitch, like the pitch of the other conifers, is a good medicine. How are you doing, Liz Chaim? Um, not too bad. Okay, good. And the white pine, another uh, of the pine, which Liz Chaim taught me about, um, that it used to be way, way more common on Vancouver Island in Tauchin Territory. There used to be huge white pine trees, so big that um, when they were cut, uh, you could hardly crawl over the logs, they were so big. And then the Eastern white pine blister rust came and infected our white pine trees. And now you hardly see them in the forests at all. It's like they're not, they weren't there. And yet, in the past, they were a really important part of the forest. The pitch of this pine is used for medicine as well. And then I mentioned the Douglas fir, the big old growth fir. You can use the bark for a really hot fuel. But the young saplings of the Douglas fir are, are what are often used to make the poles for dip nets. Say if you're fishing on the Fraser River, which the Cowichan people did do, went over and fished along the Fraser uh, with their relatives there, and um, or for fishing for sturgeon. Um, Liz Jean told me how you you actually probe the ground with or the the bottom of the river, and you can feel the sturgeon. And, and you know where to put the spear after a while if you're really good, good at it. The, um, the pitch wood of Douglas fir is also a good for fire, fire starting and good for torches. And pay the Western red cedar, one of the most important of all the trees because uh, the, the, the trunks are used for canoes, of course, but also for splitting for planks and for posts of houses uh, going way back. Uh, for a lot of other purposes, the branches are used to make rope. The inner bark is used for mats and baskets and clothing. And it's also, like many of these other plants, a very spiritual plant that has its own 
very special spiritual uses and uh, ceremonial uses as well. So when people harvest the bark of the Western red cedar or yellow cedar, or when they harvest other plant products as well, they don't kill the tree unless they need to take the entire tree for something. If they're just taking bark, they take a strip from the tree and leave it. And the tree will eventually heal itself and grow back over and continue to grow. And the trees that, are, that have had parts harvested from them, bark or even planks, are called culturally modified trees. And you can find thousands of these culturally modified trees in forests up and down the coast and also in the interior in some places. And what they are is a record of people's sustainable use of forest products. So they only kill trees if they need the entire tree or use the entire tree. And uh, they leave the trees living and the other plants that they use as well have ways of keeping them living. And another really important plant, a tree with very tough wood, very strong wood, uh, the, the Pacific yew. This team, are you able to pronounce the name for the yew tree? No, what? Ta. Thank you. And that means bow plant, the, a plant that's used for bows. It's also used for uh, digging sticks, for camas bulbs and for clams, for wedges and other things, other implements that require a lot of strength. And of course, um, most people now know of the importance of you as a medicine tree, the, uh, the anti-cancer drug Taxol is derived from the yew tree, but people have been using it for medicine for thousands of years. And there's a place, as, as Lucien pointed out, on the north side of the Cowichan River that's named after the yew tree. In fact, there are place names all over Cowichan territory that are named after plants. And then we have a tree that uh, is well known right now with the largest leaves of any deciduous tree native to Canada, the big leaf maple. And this tree, one of the names, Kumanov, means a paddle tree, I believe. I hope I'm right. <laughs> and uh, it, because the wood makes really excellent paddles for canoes. And Luz Chim explained when he was uh, hunting, when, if he would hunt a deer and kill the deer, um, they would clean it almost right away and fill the cavity with maple leaves and with fireweed. And that uh, helps to season the meat. It gives it a really sweet taste when they come to actually, uh, cut the meat up. Another really important tree that um, has a lot of value, its wood is considered one of the best for uh, fuel for smoking fish, um, but it, it, you can eat the inner bark, the sap, the cambium, growing tissues between the bark and the wood in the springtime. It, it can be quite sweet in the spring, but then it starts to get a bitter and dry up in the summertime. The bark, you can see here, this piece of bark has been exposed to the air and it's turned a bright red orange. It's used widely as a source of red and orange dye, even brownish dye. Um, and it's also a really important medicine. People use it to treat a number of different sicknesses, tuberculosis I've heard from, and skin ailments and digestive tract ailments of various kinds. And the wood is also good for carving, uh, for masks and other items. So it's a really important tree, as well as being a source of uh, nitrogen fixing nodules in its roots. So it's a pioneer tree that comes in after a fire or after logging. Um, and it should never be treated as a weed, as has been done in some forestry practices.
willows, squella, swella, uh, used for um, the this very tough fibrous bark is used for making binding fish traps. And in fact, for the Saanich people of southern of the southern tip of Vancouver Island, uh, they they are the ones who specialized a lot in the reef nets. And the reef nets are called squala, uh, the same as the willow tree, because they're made from the bark of willow. And um, they're a special kind of net that is set out between two canoes. And uh, wait, when the salmon runs come through, they, they uh, imitate the bottom of the ocean and the fish swim into these traps. And then the canoes can close together and they trap the salmon that way on their way to the Fraser River. But they always leave, make sure that plenty of the fish get through. Um, they don't take them all by any means. They have a, a special ceremony where they recognize the first salmon. And in the old days, that ceremony would run for four days so that enough salmon would be getting through all the time before they actually started catching them. Feel free to add anything, Liz Jim. I hope I'm saying the right things here. Yeah, you're saying the right things. Um, OK. You're doing OK, Nancy. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, you've been around me enough that you you know what to what to do. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, sorry, Liz sorry Jean. to leave you guys, but thank you, Liz Jean. Yeah. Yeah, it was wonderful to have you, even for a short time, for people to be able to hear you and see you. And okay. um, I'll be in touch soon. Okay. Okay. Thank okay. you. Okay. I'll just carry on then and uh, not too much longer, but I, I hope I hope you've enjoyed getting to see this team and hear him a little bit anyways. He is such a kind and knowledgeable man. Then we have uh, the black cottonwood tree. And uh, as Liz Chin said, uh, when the when the roots are exposed along the edge of the river, you can uh, brew that up and make a hair shampoo from it. Um, and he, he talks about how to make it. But the main, uh, the most knowledgeable uh, or the, the best known part of the cottonwood is the, is the resinous buds that are produced in the, uh, over the winter and are right now just starting to swell up and uh, leaf out. And these buds are covered with a, a yellowish sticky resin um, that is used um, to make a cosmetic uh, boiled with the fat from the stomach of a deer. Or nowadays you can use um, beeswax and a bit of olive oil and you can make a, a wonderful medicinal salve for your skin or for cuts and wounds. And it smells really sweet, just like the cottonwood itself smells in the spring when the buds are coming out. So people uh, all over the place make this uh, cottonwood bud salve. You can also eat the inner bark of the cottonwood like you do the alder and the pine and the hemlock and some of the other trees, not yew tree though. Um, and cottonwood, although on the coast we have lots of cedar, so dugout canoes were made of cedar mainly, but in the interior where cedar isn't as common, people made dugout canoes out of cottonwood trees. And then we have uh, the well-known cascara, which is uh, best known perhaps as, as used as a commercial pharmaceutical, uh, as a laxative, but um, the wood itself is used for carving different types of tools, especially implement handles. This team's father, Simon Charlie, used to make his, his uh, ads handles from cascara wood. Uh, and it's also used in other ways for medicine as a tonic and so forth. And Liz Chim and many others of his generation um, earned money in the 1950s and 1960s by harvesting cascara bark and selling it to the pharmaceutical companies. Crabapple, quaop, 
another important food plant it has tiny apples. They're about the size of the end of your finger growing in clusters and they're quite tart. Um, but people would cook them up and, uh, and store them in wooden boxes or later barrels underwater in the winter time they get sweeter as they get as they um, they don't really ferment but they just uh, sit and get softer and sweeter over the winter. Also, Luchimo was uh, if he was hunting grouse, he knew to look for the grouse in the crab apple trees because they really like crab apples as do some of the other birds. And Tolum, the bitter cherry, another one of the important trees of our area. Many people don't realize we have native cherries here, but we, we do. We have this bitter cherry with a very beautiful satiny bark that you can peel off the outer layer and use it to, uh, to decorate baskets and to wrap implements like bows and so forth. And also cherry bark is an important medicine. The, um, the cherries themselves are edible, but quite tart. Uh, you wouldn't want to eat too much of them, but as Luz Chim said, you can put a few in your mouth and they'll help to quench your thirst if you're hiking in the mountains. He made me a beautiful walking stick out of a uh, cherry and said uh, the reason why he used cherry was that it's a medicine tree and if you use it as a walking stick it'll help you to heal your legs or whatever. So People looked after all of these plants in different ways, everything from clearing and burning areas to promote the growth of camas or berry bushes to weeding and replanting the root vegetables, pruning some of the shrubs and trees, um, and the distributed harvesting that Luchim talked about, as well as ceremonial management, like this first salmon ceremony for the salmon. So when people would harvest medicine, they wouldn't take the whole tree or they wouldn't girdle the tree. Instead, they just take a piece of the bark like is shown here on this alder tree up in the Kitlope Valley. But they would do the same for any kind of tree bark that they were harvesting. But uh, with uh, Saskatoon berry, Luz Chim recognized four different varieties of this berry in Cowichan areas. And uh, they use the the stems for arrows and needles and so forth. And the wood is used for dip nets as well. And so they would just partially harvest the, the Saskatoon. And for the ocean sprayer ironwood, they would actually coppice the bushes sometimes right down to the ground. So they would produce long straight shoots that after a few years made wonderful barbecuing sticks. Um, and arrows and needles. And then when they got older, they could be used for digging sticks and so forth. And the brown seed heads of this plant are used for medicine for diarrhea. The red osier dogwood, or what's called red willow, people again eat the berries just as a mouth freshener, um, but they use the leaves and bark as a medicine to draw poison out from bee stings and so forth and it's used to make sweat lodges for ceremonial purposes. The hazelnut, many people don't realize we have a native hazelnut here, but these are very important uh, as a source of food, the nuts, but also the, um, the wives are used in a similar way to uh, those of the other shrubs for um, implements, needles and so forth. Everyone knows salal, taka. The berries are really important or harvest in enormous quantities, cooked up using red hot rocks and spread out over skunk cabbage leaves to dry in cakes. And these would be stored in baskets and boxes over winter and could just be soaked overnight to give you what would be very similar to the fresh berries. The the branches are also used as a, around the food in pit cooking, in cooking pits. And we have Oregon grape. Again, the berries are quite tart, but you could put a few of them in your mouth to uh, stave off thirst. And the, the bark 
produces a bright yellow compound, uh, which is used for yellow dye, but it's also used medicinally for various purposes. There are two species of the Oregon grape, named after the yellow coloring. Devil's club is a very, very important plant throughout its range, used for medicine, mostly the inner bark. It's a spiritual plant as well. Liz Chim would always, as a medicine maker, he would harvest devil's club and always put a few of the branches back into the mud where he was harvesting so that they would take root and grow into new, uh, new plants. So he would never diminish the, the overall um, quantity of the plants. Uh, many of you know this is a plant from the peat bogs or muskeg areas, the Labrador tea, recently put into the genus Rhododendron. So this word Leedum is the old genus name and it makes a really wonderful tea. And then we have uh, the stink currant named for its kind of rank mousy smell, but the berries are delicious and um, it's also used as a source of medicine. Well, this material information that I'm sharing with you is all in, in the book. So I'm going through this rather quickly because I guess our time is running out and I don't want to keep you too long. Then we have the several species of gooseberries and currants, not just the stink currant, but also the coastal black gooseberry, which really flavorful berries um, and very well liked. We also have uh, the sticky gooseberry, which isn't very common anymore at all. Um, but Luz Chim remembered harvesting those. They're quite large and hairy, but have a nice flavor to them. The stems are used as a medicine as well. All of these are raspberry relatives. The thimbleberry, the black cap, the salmonberry with its different color forms and the trailing, the native trailing blackberry. And not only are the berries of all of these edible, but you can eat the young shoots in the springtime. You can peel them and eat them uh, just like you would celery or something like that. And you can imagine how welcome the fresh greens would be in the springtime after a winter of eating mostly stored food. Very rich in vitamin C as well. Thusky, they're called the edible shoots of thimbleberry and salmonberry. And we have two species of elderberry that are native to the Cowichan area and the Ladysmith area. Um, the blue elderberry uh, isn't as common and is always found around village sites, which makes me suspect that people may have brought it over to the island at one point and planted it in their villages. Um, the berries of both are edible, but you should always cook, the, especially the red elderberries before you eat them, because the seeds and the bark and leaves and roots contain a cyanide producing compound, which is used with care for medicinal purposes, but you don't want to eat too much of those. You don't want to chew up the seeds of these elderberries. And we have the squaysum, the soapberry, which isn't common on Vancouver Island, but does like to grow in uh, limestone areas, like around the top of the Malahat. You can find them growing there. They're male and female on different bushes, so you have to find the female ones if you want to get berries. And these berries have a natural detergent them that allows them to be whipped up like egg whites and made into this beautiful pink froth that is still a very important food for a lot of people uh, throughout British Columbia. And then we have all of the berries that are related to the blueberry, huckleberries, blueberries and of different kinds, and cranberries that grow in the peat bogs. These are all important berries for the couch and people. And of course, camas, the number one root vegetable, my friend Christopher Paul used to call it. Uh, there are two species of camas that grow in southeastern Vancouver Island, the giant camas and the common camas. And people would burn over areas to maintain the prairies, open prairies. They dug them 
the bulbs selectively um, when the plants were going to seed so that they would never diminish. We actually um, did a quantitative study once of camas bulbs based on the quantities that we heard people were harvesting. Every family would harvest maybe two potato sacks full of camas bulbs every year. And if you count it out and multiply out by the number of families and the number of communities on Vanier Island, we figured they were harvesting about 10 million gas bulbs a year, every year. And yet the places to find camas today are the places where people used to dig them in the past. Ah, yes. And here, Alice Chim talks about how they burned the ground every few years uh, from many different elders who told him about that. Uh, so you burn the grounds to sweeten it, he said, his great grandpa would say. And the strawberries and the berries, they all get really big. And now you don't see them very big at all because burning has been banned for a long time. And I mentioned the skunk cabbage that people would spread the berry cooked berries out on them to dry. You don't eat the leaves of the skunk cabbage, but they're used like wax paper to wrap around food. And you can make makeshift cups and berry containers with the with the leaves. And the stinging nettle, a really important source of stem fiber used to make fishing line fishing nets. Um, on the Fraser and all over the place, and also used uh, medicinally um, as a counter irritant. So these are really important plants. With their, all of them have their own names and their own uses. Here's a photo from Edward Curtis of Thule, a Cowichan Lake a Thule gatherer, and these. These uh, round stem bulrushes around the edges of lakes have been used to make mats that are used for sleeping, um, for drying berries on, and to, for shelter as well. So um, these are some of the issues that I've learned from Luz Chim and others about when we talk about medicinal and spiritual plants, that there's there are a lot of protocols that uh, need to be recognized. And a lot of that knowledge about their use is confidential. And this is not only uh, because people want uh, are selfish about their knowledge, but there's, they're also concerned about the knowledge being misused, uh, maybe plants being over harvested, or people hurting themselves by not knowing how to use them properly or correctly. So these are the knowledge um, that we're talking about here is part of the intellectual property rights of people like Liz Chim and the other people who use these plants and learn about them, which is why we don't we don't use a lot of we don't have a lot of detailed information about medicinal plants in the book. But one of the most widely used medicinal plants, the yarrow, um, we do talk about. It's used as a plant for colds and coughs. And the tea is drunk as a tonic. It's used to stop bleeding um, and used as an aromatic bath for sick people and so forth, as a smudge against mos mosquitoes. A really, really important plant worldwide. And another aromatic plant, a uh, plant in the carrot celery family, is used again, both medicinally and spiritually, as an incense for cleansing for coughs and colds and for the throat. And finally, uh, a very important uh, plant, a spiritual plant that's used uh, for cleansing and for purification with strong spiritual value and said to be a, a source of really good luck. And so I leave you with that, with this beautiful plant, the wild ginger, um, and wish you all the best. Hi, Chika.